Now on BBC One Sunday premiere. Based on the sensational murder case of the 1950s, Richard Gordon's play stars Timothy West as the good Dr. Bodkin Adams. Does it happen? Just after four. Peaceful at the end? Oh, perfectly. I have the devil's own busy day ahead. Uh, there we. Death certificate. Cremation certificate. I've signed both. Cause of death, cerebral thrombosis. Mrs. Grantly, it's one of her mornings. She's being rather difficult. Leave it to us. Leave it to me. Now, my dear, what's oh. the trouble? Only one I trust of all these strange people around oh, me. Oh, come, come. If I could only rest, get some sleep. You're taking the capsules, the matron's injection? Mm. They don't seem to touch me anymore. I'll get you something special. You'll go off to a nice doze, my dear. I don't mind if I never wake up. Now, that's blasphemy. God gives us life to take it as sin. Bobby Hullett never woke up. <laughs> she was a lovely girl. So full of life until she died. I never thought she'd do it. I did. She was enormously upset by the death of her husband. They were dear patients of mine both. <sighs> that inquest last month was terribly, terribly unfair. It set tongues wagging. <laughs> Didn't even hurt. Ah, ah, I'm beginning to feel sleepy. <clears throat> oh, uh, yes, I, I want you to have this. After I've gone. <laughs> Oh, it is a wondrously pretty thing. Yes. That's very thoughtful. That's very generous. God bless you. Oh, I'm ever so sleepy. I 
should pray for you. O oh, blessed Lord, Father of mercies, look down with tenderness and compassion upon this thy afflicted servant. And to God's gracious mercy and protection we commit you. Amen. Poor Mrs. Grantley. Oh, there's a lady called Mrs. Langton Jones came to see me. Needs a new will and that. Put her house in order. I told her you'd look after her. Oh, thank you. One professional man must help another. The uh, bloodhound from Scotland Yard is still digging up wills. I've been remembered in the wills of 15 patients over the past 10 years. I'm perfectly frank about it. When people are old and lonely, a doctor is very often the only friend they have. Why shouldn't you remember your friend in your will? Indeed. Like Jack and Bobby Hullett. If she hoarded all those sleeping tablets that I prescribed for her after her husband died and took the lot all at once, well, it could happen to any patient. Any doctor? Of course. And the gossip said that I drugged poor Bobby because of what I got out of her will, a hundred pounds. What about the sports car? Oh, that was promised me by her husband before his operation. I got down the Queen's surgeon, you know. How old are you, my dear? Not a word to a soul. Seventy-two. No. I do not advise an operation on the hip. Dr. Thackeray was quite bloodthirsty for one. I don't think he began to understand my case. My terrible depression. Since your dear husband died, I'll give you something. Now, look, my dear, this is a national health prescription. You're a private patient. You should pay for your own drugs. Cost you a fortune. Hand this to the chemist. It's a shilling. And we'll have some of the government's Elastic stockings while we're about it. Five bob a pair. Tickety boo. I must say it's a relief to have someone to guide me now that I've no husband. About your fees, Doctor. Well, you know, I often say to my patients, if you'd care to remember me in your will, I could scale them down. That way, I wouldn't have to pay tax on them, you see. Do you know how much I paid in super tax last year? A thousand pounds. You're very businesslike, Doctor. Mm. I'd like to see you give that hip a complete rest for a bit. There's an excellent nursing home, the Balmoral. The matron's a wonderful woman. I'll see when they can fit you in. I'm just thankful to miss the op. I was sorry about Mrs. Grant, you doctor. It was so sudden. Oh, she was a very sick woman, my child. Well, she wasn't that morning. She was throwing things around like a coconut shell. Nurse! I'm sorry, matron, but if I'm nursing the patient, I have to know what she's getting. Dr. Adams didn't even enter the injection to Mrs. Grantley in the treatment book. God forgive my sins of omission. It was morphine, my child, a normal dose. The poor soul then had a cerebral hemorrhage and passed on. If you had any questions about the doctor's treatment, nurse, you should have raised them before Mrs. Grantley was cremated. That will be all, nurse. You can hardly blame the nurses for talking. 
What are you giving her? Morphine. Four grains. Well, that's 12 times the maximum dose, isn't it? Well, she's been on morphine for six months now. You know how tolerant they get to it. Anything less than four grains would be water off a duck's back. You'll enter the four grains in your own dangerous drugs register. With all these old folk needing medication. Hard to keep track. Mm -hmm. You get yourself into trouble, you know. Nobody fusses about the anesthetics that they give at the hospital. And nothing's more dangerous than pentothal and ether. I just turn on the gas and let them have it. Repeat as necessary. I leave with the file. The headaches, how are they? Splitting. Would you like me to take a look at you, my dear? Doesn't matter. It's probably only migraine. Perhaps I'd better. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I turn to the Mayor's last guest of the evening, Dr. John Bodkin Adams. Dear friend of all of us who have the affairs of Eastbourne in our hands and in our hearts. A kind and wise physician to the many sick and infirm in our midst. Who holds his head high, despite the poisonous and malicious gossip of the London newspapers. My best reply to that, Mr. Chairman, is myself and my family have the utmost trust as our doctor in John Bodkin Adams. Is that the coroner? It's John Adams here. I was asleep. Oh, I'm sorry. Look, could I arrange a private post-mortem for one of my patients now? A Mrs. Midgley at the relative's expense. What? When did the patient die? Uh, oh, oh, she's not dead yet. What? what? What do you mean? Phoning about a death which hasn't yet happened? But it is expected, and when it does happen, I, I won't know why. That's why I want a private BM. Certainly not. Report the death to me officially. When it has happened, and I'll look into it. Good night. You made her last days, perhaps the happiest days of her life. You know, I can't understand the coroner fussing about the post-mortem. It simply proved that the poor soul died of natural causes. You see, you... Hannum. I thought all the fuss had died down. What did you want? He was asking about Mrs. Grantley, Mrs. Midgley, other patients. 
They took away my dangerous drugs register. God knows my conscience is clear. Well, God may know, but Eastbourne does not. Oh, gossip. The laughter of fools. The crackling of thorns under the pot. I can't stand a scandal. You know I'm not well. Judge me with an open mind, my dear. I implore you, don't listen to tittle-tattle. We doctors are but the doorkeepers of life of both extremities. Our duty is sometimes to oil the hinges. It's a duty that falls to all doctors, sooner or later. You are taking the tablets. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, Doctor. I'm sorry. I, I got held up with a, a case. Thank you. No better way to relax than a rubber or two of bridge in charming company. Thank you. Shall we? Yes, I've got a little present for you. Chocolates. Handmade. Thank you. We know how you like them. Oh, you spoil me. You spoil me. Well, from all of us, you spoil us, Doctor. You look after us so wonderfully. Do have one. Delicious. Shall I shuffle? We haven't met. I'm Superintendent Hannum. I was admiring your calf. Doctor needs a reliable make. Left you by Mrs. Morell with a chest of silver cutlery. She was a very dear patient. And a very rich one. Didn't she leave £175,000? She insisted a long time before she died that I had these things in her memory. To tell you the truth, I never wanted the cutlery. I'm a bachelor. I never use it. Mrs. Morell was cremated. Yes, her ashes were scattered over all the channel. It was a very moving ceremony. But you signed the uh, cremation certificate that you didn't know you were a beneficiary. Oh, that was not done deceitfully. God knows it wasn't. And the cremation certificate of Mr. Jack Hallett? No, no, he was a lifelong friend. He was ostentatious about his wealth. He liked to talk about it. He promised me a long time before his death that he'd left me some money in his will. To be honest with you, I thought it'd be more than it was. It's quite a serious offence, Doctor. More serious than the forgery of national health prescriptions. Forgery? You um, provided elastic stockings for some of your private patients, like Mrs. Langton Jones. I only wanted to save the poor soul a few bob. <laughs> you cannot be deaf, Doctor, to rumours in this town. Those who know me know them to be untrue. For those who believe them, well, there's nothing I can do. Mr. Hannum, my father died when I was 14. My brother died like that. I studied medicine, worked too hard, had a breakdown, got TB. In the end, I did two years' work in one and qualified. I had a Christian upbringing, and it was God's guidance that brought me to Eastport. I live for my work. I made a vow to God that I would look after my national health patients. Day and night, I turn out for them. I never ask anyone else to do it for me. I think this has made other people jealous of me. 
Surely you're finding these rumors untrue. I'm afraid that is not my experience, Doctor. I'm making some inquiries into the deaths of some of your patients. And I don't think they're all natural. Not natural? Easing the passing of a dying person is not all that wicked. Surely that can't be murder. We shall see, won't we? Don't hurry. Be thorough. I think this is all part of God's plan to teach me a lesson. Now, I shall get the home office on Thursday and Friday, then I'm taking the weekend off, which I must say I do deserve. Back at the yard on Monday. And on Tuesday, I shall be back here, when I'll be going straight to the Balmoral nursing home to interview the matron. All right, Brindley? Yes, sir. She was a magnificent matron. She looked after hundreds of my patients at the Balmoral. It won't be the same nursing home without her. Death last Friday was quite a shock to everybody. Oh, not to me. I looked after her professionally, you know. Did you expect that sudden stroke? Oh, her blood pressure was up in the clouds. search warrant. But I'm off to deliver the prizes at the YMCA. Selina, my dear, telephone that I'm delayed. Uh, Brinley, check the blinds around the front. We do not wish to be observed by the world's press. I am looking for dangerous drugs. What do you mean by dangerous drugs? Poisons? Morphine, heroin, pethidin, and the like? Oh, that group. Oh, no, you'll find none here. I very, very seldom use them. I may perhaps have one little file in my bag, but uh, no more. Your prescription, Doctor, for Mrs. Morell. Oh, yes. Yes, I used to leave them at the chemist's or at her house. She had nurses day and night. Who administered the drugs, Doctor? I injected some, the nurses some. But, Doctor, you prescribed for her the 75-1-6 grain heroin tablets. Uh, poor soul, she was in terrible agony. I am not a doctor, but surely a quantity of dangerous drugs that you obtained for Mrs. Morell would be fatal. And is pain usual with what she died of? A cerebral vascular accident? I am not dishonest with drugs. Were all these drugs given to her? Well, how can I remember? There may have been a lot left over when she died. Haven't you a clinical card? I don't keep records. I only record visits, perhaps not those for private patients. I should like to see your dangerous drugs registered, Doctor. I haven't got one. I shall search the premises. Good. <laughs> Mrs. Hallett, what are you doing, Doctor? Nothing. What is it? Morphine. One was for Mrs. Soden. She died at the Grand Hotel. The other was for Mrs. Sharp. She died before I could use it. Yes, I was silly. This is the 
famous morel piece. Still in its native tissue paper. Mrs. Morell was a capricious will maker, Doctor. Old folk are always altering their wills. It's the only way they have left to impress their personalities on the world, before and after they've left it. Patients die when they must. We try to make it as comfortable as possible. She died when you were sure of getting the Rolls Royce and uh, the silver. Perhaps your patience was exhausted, Doctor. Greed. The desire to possess something you coveted. Perhaps they overcame you. Mrs. Morell was a dear, dear friend. She only wanted me to have these things in her memory. God knows. God knows. Dr. Adams. I'm now going to arrest you, and I'm going to take you down to the local police headquarters where you will be charged with the murder of Mrs. Morell. I have to caution you that anything you say will be taken down and may be given in evidence. Murder? Can you prove it was murder? I did not think you could prove murder. She was dying in any event. You can't arrest me. I'm a doctor. My overcoat, you have the dress overcoat. Mr. Lawrence, thank you for all you did for me in the police court that he's born. I'll be outside, sir, in case I'm needed. Right, officer. Being looked after, all right? Obviously, it's peculiar for a professional man to find himself in a place like this. 
But I have God to fortify me. Prisoner number 7889. Since I'm only on remand, I can wear my own clothes. I get clean linen, newspapers, and books. The company is not what I choose, to be sure, but I'd be the same thing being run over in a strange town and finding yourself in a public hospital ward, wouldn't it? Yes, well, we have a date fixed for your trial, three weeks on Monday. Oh, that's a relief. It'll be good to get it over, get back to normal. Dr. Adams, you probably don't tell all your patients their chances of survival, but you would those who felt intelligent and responsible and deserved to know. Mm -hmm. Well, I must tell you, your chances of acquittal are not good. But surely, Mr. Lawrence, I have done nothing wrong. With Mrs. Morell, I merely helped a poor soul who was suffering. Others may not see it that way. If I'm guilty of anything, it is in not keeping a register of dangerous drugs and being a little lax, like everyone else, over the cremation certificates. <laughs> now, Dr. Adams, you, you will make my task considerably easier if you remember that it is to defend you on a charge of murder. Now, you may think it outrageous that you should so be charged. Perhaps it is. But if the verdict goes against you, you will suffer the death penalty. Well, that's unbelievable. Many men have sat in this very room and thought the same. Mistakenly, I regret to say. I don't wish to upset you in the slightest, but it is my duty to bring home to you the extreme seriousness of your position. The prosecution will be led by Sir Reginald Manningham Buller, the Attorney General himself. And who is the judge? Well, I hope one of the enlightened ones, Devlin. Now, I am particularly interested in what you said to Superintendent Hannam. Do you remember the Towpath murder? Oh, something in the papers uh, three or four years ago, wasn't it? A half-witted youth called Whiteway allegedly raped a shop girl and then murdered her with an axe. He tossed her body into the Thames near Teddington Lock. In this very room, the youth signed a full and vivid confession on four sheets of paper. The only snag was that Hannam probably made it up. When Hannam asked you whether all the drugs you prescribed had actually been given to Mrs. Morell, what did you say? Well, I told the truth. I said there may have been a lot left over when she died. Hannam says you told him all these drugs had been given to the patient. Well, she's not telling the truth. I, I told him I didn't keep records. John Bodkin Adams, you are charged with the murder 
of Edith Ellis Morell on the 13th of November, 1950. Do you plead guilty or not guilty? I am not guilty, my lord. May it please your lordship and members of the jury, I appear to prosecute in this case and the accused will be defended by my learned friend, Mr. Lawrence. Members of the jury, Mrs. Morell was a widow, aged 81, and while staying with her son in Cheshire, she had a stroke. Since 1949, her doctor was Dr. Adams. Oh, I thought you were never coming. Look at me, look at me. I'm all paralyzed down one side. Oh, my dear, you have been in the wars, but you're safe and sound at home now, and I'm here to look after you. Oh, doctor, I'm so miserable. Have you any pain? No. No pain. I feel so weak. I can't sleep. Oh, don't worry, my dear. I'll give you a little something. I don't want you in my sight. If you don't mind, Sister Mason Ellis. What is that you're giving me? It's a special injection of my own. It'll cheer you up. Is it morphia? Your constitution's very sound. You have many more years to enjoy yet. The effects of the injections wear off, don't they? Well, then we can give you a little bit more. No harm in that. It is one thing to give an old lady something to help her to sleep, quite another to prescribe for her excessive doses of morphia and heroin. Now, the night before she died, she was given two injections with this 5cc syringe. Not once did Dr. Adams tell any of his nurses what his injections were. And the prosecution submits that Mrs. Morell died in a coma following an overdose of heroin and morphia, and that overdose was administered by Dr. Adams and that it was murder. She was cremated, so therefore nobody could tell how much morphia or heroin was in her body. And Dr. Adams signed the cremation form stating that he had no um, pecuniary interest in her death. Nurse Stronach, when you were nursing Mrs. Morell, did you see Dr. Adams preparing special hypodermic injections? Every night. Perhaps you tell the jury exactly what happened. Eleven o'clock. You're so regular, Doctor. Never miss a night. How is she? Going downhill, if you ask me. Well, it's quite a long time since she had the stroke, you know. She's very, very feeble. But she can still get attacks of filthy temper towards us nurses. I put it down to all the drugs she's been having. Drugs? Oh, no. It's due to the condition of the arteries in her brain, which gave her the stroke in the first place. Is she having any pain? She says she has pains. I consider them to be neurotic. Nurse, when you go down to the drug cupboard, you've got the key. And give me some sterile water for the injection. I've run out. Dr. Adams, what injections do you give her every night, exactly? It's a special one of my own. Why'd you ask? I wondered if it was more morphia. You see, she's so very dopey already when I've given her that grain of morphia that you order for nine o'clock. After all, it is four times the normal dose. And most of the time, she's semi-conscious and rambling, or even comatose. The sterile water, please, nurse. Everything that happened of any importance in a patient's illness would go down in a book. Quite correct. Every time we gave an injection, we wrote down what it was and the time and signed our names. It's the proper thing to do when you're nursing. And whatever you wrote in that book, 
would be absolutely correct because it would be done right at that very moment, not only injections, but visits by the doctor. As distinct from your memory, six to seven years later, those reports would be absolutely correct. Yes. Correct for each of us three nurses. If only we had those reports. We could then see the exact truth of what happened day and night. But you have my word for it. I want you to have a look at this book, please. Is that one of the books in which the nurses made their day and night reports in Mrs. Morell's case? Yes. My lord, is that book an exhibit in this case? Uh, no, but it soon will be. Well, then the Crown has a right to see it, my lord. I have seven more here. My lord. If these books, my lord, are to be used as evidence, the jury must be allowed to see them. My lord, I have a suitcase full of copies. Please look at the night report for June the 4th, 1950, in your own handwriting. It shows that you yourself gave no injections and that the doctor did not pay a visit, that the patient complained of pain and woke at 6.15 in a temper, calling you a nasty common woman. Mrs. Morell is a very autocratic patient. Indeed, Nurse Lord. Would Mrs. Morell ever allow the nurses in the room when the doctor visited? No. Mrs. Morell told me that when I arrived. In the whole of your first spell of duty, June 1950, you never recorded having given an injection yourself at all and never recorded a visit by the doctor. No, not that I have recorded. Are you saying that if you, as a nurse of years of experience, had given an injection of a quarter of a grain of morphine, you would not have put it down in the book? No. Your memory was playing a trick. Apparently so. Obviously so, is it not? It's a very long time to remember these things. You told my learned friend, the Attorney General, that Mrs. Morell was in a semi-conscious condition and rambling. Do you realize that your colleague, Sister Mason Ellis, recorded that this semi-conscious woman ate for lunch that very day a small quantity of partridge, a small quantity of celery, a small quantity of pudding, and a small quantity of brandy and soda? But these would be very small quantities. I'm not saying that she had an enormous meal of partridge and celery and pudding and brandy and soda. I am simply suggesting that this is another complete trick by your memory to say that on your last day, Mrs. Morell was either semi-conscious or rambling. I have nothing to say. Nurse, where else but from his bag did Dr. Adams obtain the drugs which he injected? They were kept in a locked cupboard in the dining room. He would ask us for the key. Thank you, Nurse Donnick. Right from the start, Sister Mason Ellis, when you went there in August 1949, from your reports in the nursing record books, uh, in the evenings, usually about 8.40 p.m., Mrs. Morell was given an injection of morphia, a quarter of a grain, and heroin, a quarter of a grain. My lord, this is the consistent routine dose, and the Crown is not seeking to challenge it. I am much obliged to my learned friend. And for months and months, that routine sedation was maintained uh, day after day without any alteration. So far as the record books were concerned, yes. I take it that what you wrote in those reports over your signature is what really happened? Of course. 
I'm innocent. God knows I'm innocent. I will charitably suppose that you're a stupid man trying to deceive yourself rather than a cunning one trying to deceive me. You know perfectly well you committed some extremely questionable acts in Eastbourne. I have still to convince the jury of highly technical matters about the use of morphia if you're to get away with it. But the judge will understand. He's a professional man like myself. Do you notice how I always bow to him every time I enter the dock? No, he never bows back. You can tell if a man is sick or not. Any doctor can. Well, any lawyer can tell if a man is lying or not. In the witness box, the Crown can ask you about the Hullets, Mrs. Miller, Bradnam, Grantley, Midgley, anyone they like, as dangerous as strolling along the edge of your Eastbourne cliffs in the dark. I have nothing to hide. You've plenty. And let us hope it remains hidden, unlike the notebooks, which may well have saved your life. Some information just phoned through which might be useful. The three nurses were heard talking at Eastbourne Station last night. I have to learn almost as much medicine before breakfast as the average medical student does in five years. <coughs> uh, is this correct? Yes. Any other witnesses? Uh, no. Well? With this and the notebooks, our good doctor seems to enjoy rather better luck than most of his patients. Sister Miss Nellis, after yesterday's hearing, did you and Nurse Stronach, who has already given evidence, and Nurse Randall, who is about to give evidence, travel from Victoria to Eastbourne together in the same railway carriage? We did. With copies of the evening newspapers before you, reading reports together of this case? Yes. And discussing them together? Discussing what was in the newspapers, yes. Discussing, moreover, a cabinet in which drugs were kept in the dining room of Mrs. Morell's house. It was discussed, I think. And did Nurse Randall say, on arrival at Eastbourne, about that particular cabinet, don't say that or you'll get me into trouble? I cannot answer that. You cannot answer that? Must I? Yes. Yes. What was it she told you not to say? Really, I, I can't remember, because I was not terribly interested, if I may say so. I am not asking you to remember something that happened seven years ago, but something that happened when you got off the train last night. What was it? The drugs were kept in a drawer, in the sideboard, and there was no key. Did you know that Nurse Stronach told my lord yesterday that those drugs were kept in a locked cupboard in Mrs. Morell's house, of which you nurses only had the key and produced it only when the doctor wished to visit that cupboard? I think I saw it in the papers. If there was no cupboard, there was no key and no locking. So the whole of the evidence given by Nurse Stronach was untrue, was it not? Yes, and that is why we were discussing it. Um, <clears throat> you were glad that these notebooks were found for that reason. They tell the truth. Yes. Hmm. May the 11th, 1950, your handwriting. Mrs. Morell wished she was dead and wished she knew a doctor who would put her to sleep forever. There are many entries of that sort of thing. Yes. September the 24th. Her breathing was rapid, 34 to the minute. Almost twice the normal rate, is it not? When a person is under the influence of heroin and morphia, their breathing tends to get slow, does it not? Yes, it does. This was just the opposite. But quite typical of the closing stages of cerebral thrombosis. Yes, it is. Nurse Randall, we come to um, November the 9th, four nights before Mrs. Morell died. Was not Dr. Adams giving even larger doses of morphia and heroin? Yes, 
The patient was very restless. Her cough was very, very troublesome. The doctor was later than usual, and I was getting worried. Oh, doctor. Oh, I hope she wouldn't be oh. late. She's got oh. a little jerky. Poor soul, she hasn't called me. Oh, oh, very oh. nearly, several times. <laughs> She's had the routine morphine and heroin. Mm -hmm. oh. 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 What is it, doctor? Oh. Formaldehyde. Oh. Do you recognize the smell? Every medical student knows things of rotten apples. Oh. Oh. Syringe. You can give her another 5cc into muscularity if she's still restless when you're alone at night. Is Peraldehyde a dangerous drug? It helps to make you sleep. She probably needed about uh, one o'clock. You won't forget to give it. I'll be in first thing in the morning. I wouldn't say there's any need to call me. Whatever happens. Nothing else I can do for the poor soul now, except pray. Let us turn to the night, Mrs. Morell died. You told the Attorney General that you gave the second injection of peraldehyde, and an hour later the patient was dead. But you did not note it in the nursing record. I did give it, on Dr. Adams' instructions. If it was a matter of importance, it would have gone down in the book. Yes. You have no idea, seven years afterwards, why it is not in the book? No. What did you receive uh, under Mrs. Morell's will? Three hundred pounds. What is the normal dose of peraldehyde? It depends how it's given, but I think five cc is a very large dose. Did you know that peraldehyde is a very old-fashioned, well-established remedy for sleeplessness, and that it is regarded as one of the safest soporifics in use, and that the full dose prescribed by the British Pharmacopoeia, whether by mouth or injection, is 8 cc? I didn't know that. On the afternoon of March the 8th, 1950, Dr. Adams arranged to meet me in the Palm Court of the Grand Hotel Eastbourne. I arrived first, I waited for quite a while, and in the end, Dr. Adams did finally arrive. Sorry I'm late. I usually meet in more somber surroundings. <laughs> Two teas with tea cakes. I'm sorry to ask you here at such short notice. I wanted a word with you about a will of Mrs. Morell, my patient, your client. I am aware of both. I see her every day, I would sometimes twice. She promised me her Rolls Royce, you know, but um, she just remembered she's forgotten. You mean she's forgotten she'd promised? No, she forgot to put it in the will. She also wanted me to have a chest of silver. I see. That, of course, will require a codicil to her last will. Is she uh, in a fit state to make one? Oh, perfectly, perfectly. She's very ill, of course. She's a very sick woman following the effects of her stroke, but um, her mind's as clear as a bell. Well, you should know, Doctor. I thought if you prepared a codicil this afternoon, I could take it up there this evening and uh, get it signed and witnessed by one of the nurses. Dr. Adams, I, uh, I must remind you of something. A few months ago, Mrs. Morell made some gifts by a check, one in favor of yourself, which she afterwards regretted. Good lady is rather a capricious will maker. Might I suggest, as the present gifts are of great value, the matter should wait until Mrs. Morell's son Claude visits Eastbourne at the end of the week? No, you know, Mrs. Morell is very uneasy about forgetting. But she wants to get the matter out of her mind. She'll understand that. I have an idea. Why don't you ease her mind by uh, pretending to accept the silver? simply handing it over to the nurse in the other room to be uh, kept for her. No, that wouldn't do at all. Not at all. Mrs. Morell genuinely wishes me to enjoy the gifts. Look, you prepare a codicil, and I'll get Mrs. Morell to sign it. And if for some reason it doesn't meet with Mr. Claude Morell's approval, we'll tear it up. 
how many wills did Mrs. Morell make? Six. And the last of August the 24th, 1950, what happened to it? In September, Mrs. Morell was very angry that Dr. Adams had left her for a holiday. He was staying with the minister of the church in Inverness. She instructed me to prepare a codicil, cutting Dr. Adams out of her will completely. Have you that codicil? And Mrs. Morell later changed her mind. She uh, tore it up. Which in law makes not the slightest difference to its validity? Of course not. That would require Mrs. Morell's signature on another document. And there was no other document. So that when Mrs. Morell died on November the 13th, Dr. Adams was not a beneficiary under her will. That is quite correct. What was the value of the Rolls-Royce motor car? Well, it was pre-war and second-hand. What was the value of the silver in the chest? £275 and five shillings. When I asked at his house who administered the drugs that he'd prescribed for Mrs. Morell, Dr. Adams replied, I did. Nearly all. Did you know that of the drugs prescribed for the last five days of Mrs. Morell's life, <clears throat> no less than 30 and a half grains of morphia and 21 and 11 twelfth grains of heroin were not administered? according to the nurse's records. When I asked if there were any drugs left over when Mrs. Morell died, he replied, no, none. All was given to the patient. Did he not say, I cannot possibly remember, or words to that effect? No, that is quite untrue. He was most emphatic about it. Indeed, I have found him to be most loquacious ever since I have known him. It is obvious that your announcement of his arrest for murder came as a shock. It certainly was. When he said, murder, can you prove it was murder? What, what was this, murder, can you prove it was murder? What was the inflection in his voice? Dr. Adams was a very shaken man indeed. And I am not going to say whether there was any inflection of any kind. Morphia. Thank you. Ah, I thought so. Mrs. Morell had a cough. Morphia is the most powerful cough suppressant known to the medical profession. So, claiming that she actually died from those huge doses of morphine that she'd become addicted to is as ridiculous as claiming that anyone who jumps off the top of Beachy Head dies of fright. Mm -hmm. You can see my doctor made the drug peddler as respectable in Eastbourne as the milkman. Yes, he was a terrible doctor. But that is not a capital offence, though perhaps it should be. Dr. Arthur Henry Duthwaite. Yeah. Yes. Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, senior physician to Guy's Hospital and the Royal Hospital for Incurables. Incurables. President, British Gastroenterological Society. Doubtless they have excellent dinners. Address, Harley Street, member of the Garrick Club. Rather theatrical. Obviously, the country's leading expert on drugs. Well, we'll see what Sir Reginald bullying manner can get out of his expert. Mr. Lawrence, I've often wondered why precisely does the Attorney General always prosecute in cases of poisoning? It's an old English tradition, like the boat race. There was absolutely no justification for the injection of morphia and heroin after a stroke. What becomes the attitude of the patient to the doctor supplying this medication? A complete dependence. The doctor would have an ascendancy over that patient. And the same would apply to heroin. Heroin must never be used except in cases of terrible pain. Now, I want to ask you about peraldehyde. Its typical fault is its smell, which is revolting. <laughs> what would its effect be when superimposed on the administration of heroin and morphia? That would be likely to produce death. Is peraldehyde by itself a dangerous drug? Oh, no. 
Surely tolerance to this drug would occur, along with addiction. I mean, they start to lose their effect. Allowing for this tolerance, what conclusions do you draw from the excessive doses administered by Dr. Adams during the last five days prior to Mrs. Morell's death? I intended to kill her. Oh, Dr. Adams says the cause of death was cerebral thrombosis. Do the nurses' reports justify that conclusion? No. Are you saying Dr. Adams carried an intention to terminate Mrs. Morell's life into effect over her last five days? Yes. A specialist's profession is a responsible one, but I hardly suppose you have ever expressed a graver or more fateful opinion on a matter than that. No. Before going into the witness box, did you satisfy yourself that you had every piece of relevant evidence before you on which to judge? Yes. I want you to look at this document, please. The nurse's notes on Mrs. Morell from the cottage hospital in Cheshire, where she had just had her stroke. After two nights of trying to give her sleep, the doctors there resorted to morphia. Does the field of condemnation that you are spreading from the witness box include the cottage hospital in Cheshire? If they gave morphia? Three doctors, two of them not on a charge of murder, gave this particular patient morphia night after night. Surely the general practitioner, the man on the spot, exercises the best judgment. Yes. He should make the remaining months of that woman's life as bearable as possible for her, and by so doing for those who had to look after her. The first object will be to try to restore her health. That is, at the highest level, the object of every doctor, in every case. But human life being what it is, there are instances where every doctor knows that whatever he does, he cannot. Dr. Duthwaite, now before the jury can convict, they must be satisfied there was an act of murder. Dr. Adams paid 12 visits to Mrs. Morell between November the 8th and 11th when he administered drugs himself or left instructions with the nurses to do so. Now, I should like to assist the jury by telling them precisely what in each act forced you to postulate that murder was being committed. Was drawing morphia for five days from a woman having it regularly would rapidly diminish her tolerance. On November the 6th, Dr. Adams gave her a small dose of morphia, caught for grain. Effective because tolerance had been lost. But on the following day, it had jumped up to one and a half grains. On November the 8th, it was two, with a large dose of heroin. You are saying that the morphia was deliberately withheld for five days in order that it might be reintroduced fatally. I can see no other reason for it. Well, but murder is not necessarily the explanation. He may have the wrong idea. He may have old-fashioned methods. How soon might he have expected these doses to work and bring death? Oh, the steady accumulation of drugs in the body, two or three days. Accumulation of drugs? We have not heard this before. What about the peraldehyde? That would make death certain, if it were not certain already. But in your view, it was certain already. Yes. I have been struck by certain divergences in answers given by Dr. Duthwaite to me and to Mr. Lawrence. In the circumstances, I am prepared to consider an application from Mr. Lawrence to cross-examine the witness further. I am much obliged to your lordship. Are we not now at the very heart of the case? The sole difference is this, that in a case of inoperable cancer, the drugs would be justified because of the presence of pain, while in this case, the drugs would not be justified because there was only distress which falls short of severe pain. Indeed. Are you now suddenly suggesting that Dr. Adams refrained from giving a single lethal dose because it might arouse suspicion, so he gave a series of doses, an accumulation, as it were, the combined effect of which he knew would kill. That's exactly what I do mean. 
The medical theory on which that is based is absolute rubbish, is it not? I can only say I see no other explanation. The truth is, you first gave evidence on one possibility to support a charge of murder, and then thought of something else after you had started. Uh, I was turning things over in my mind. Then they crystallized. Dr. Adams embarked on a course that took 13 days to bring about Mrs. Morell's death. Even if she had only three weeks or so to live anyway. In my opinion, yes. But you cannot rule out the possibility that natural causes brought about her death at the end? It's not possible absolutely to rule out some catastrophic intervention. Like another cerebral thrombosis. Like another cerebral thrombosis. Thank you, Dr. Duthwaite. I should tell you, my lord, the defense have decided not to call Dr. Adams. I do not consider it my duty to put him in the witness box for the entertainment of the spectators in court or for the edification of the press. In summing up the evidence, I must guide you on matters of law. First, what is murder? It is an act that is intended to kill, and does indeed kill. It does not matter if death is inevitable anyway. If life is cut short by weeks or months, it is just as much murder as being cut short by years. This case depends largely upon medical evidence. Now, Dr. Duthwaite was quite uncompromising. He regarded the overdose of drugs about November the 10th as causing death. If you were to disregard the evidence of Dr. Duthwaite, the prosecution could take this matter no further. You may think it not much advantage for a doctor to get a patient under his influence, that he might make something from her will, and ending up with a chest of silver worth 275 pounds compared with 300 pounds for the night nurse. This woman was dying, and for him to anticipate her death by two or three weeks for such a paltry reward is ludicrous. You may come to the conclusion that Dr. Adams was a fraudulent rogue, but all fraudulent rogues are not murderers. You may ask, why he did not go into the witness box. It was his right not to. And I hope the day will never come when that right is denied to any Englishman. His every statement before his arrest shows it had not crossed his mind that he might be faced with the charge of murdering Mrs. Morell. Not infrequently, I hear a case presented by the prosecution that seems manifestly a strong one, and I have felt it my duty to tell the jury so. I do not think I should hesitate now to tell you that the case for the defense seems manifestly strong. Dr. Adams? Have you reached your verdict? Yes. What is your verdict? 
not guilty. My Lord, I've given most serious consideration to what course the Crown should pursue following the further indictment charging Dr. Adams with the murder of Mrs. Hullett. Though the publicity securing a fair trial would be difficult, it all depends on the evidence of Dr. Doothwaite. I've come to the conclusion that the public interest does not require Dr. Adams to go through the further ordeal of a second murder charge, so I enter early for secret. All further proceedings on that indictment are stayed. No further action taken in the court. My Lord, before Dr. Adams was charged with murder, he was charged with offences under the Dangerous Drugs Act and the Cremation Act. His bail is now expired, and I ask your Lordship to grant an extension of bail on the same terms. Down, Doctor, and we can have a little chat about England. Oh, It'll I... make us feel cooler. <laughs> you shouldn't be calling me Doctor, you know. I was stripped of that title when I had that little spot of bother. Oh, nonsense. You were the victim of circumstances, Doctor. I was the victim of a malicious campaign of gossip. I'm ashamed of Eastbourne. Mm. Well, perhaps they'd nothing better to do. Lonely widows like us. Oh. <laughs> Well, it was all a year ago now. I'm nothing but pity for the poor souls. How about another rubber or two later? Oh, yes, lovely, yes. No better way to relax, either at home or abroad, than a good evening's bridge among charming company. Now, now, Doctor. <laughs> Were those chocolates? Oh, they'll melt in this heat. May I assess a little weakness? Oh, do. Hmm. Delicious. Thank you. 